So when we get into trouble <coughs> we, with opiates, um, I think the best slide is for me to go to this one to explain it. So as, as I mentioned before, when you have um, an opiate that basically binds to the mu opioid receptor, it creates down regulation of these processes within the cell. And what then happens is you get a lower level of neuroadrenaline um, or neuroepinephrine, such that when the cell releases neuroepinephrine, it goes to the postsynaptic neuron, which is the things that regulate all of our heart rate and breathing, um, high blood pressure, those sorts of things. What happens, um, the cell wants to reset itself, so over time, even though this receptor is occupied, what is happening with inside of the cell is the upregulation of all of these secondary messenger systems. That also then leads to upregulation of neuroepinephrine, such that when the opiate receptor is then no longer uh, occupied, you have an abundance amount of neuroepinephrine that then comes out of the cell that binds postsynaptically to the cells that ends up causing uh, vasoconstriction, diaphoresis, tachycardic hypertension, and GI irritability. What clonidine does um, is it's an alpha-2 uh, adrenergic agonist. And as I mentioned, in the cells in the LC that contain all this neuroepinephrine, what you have is that clonidine then binds to the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor on the same cell that contains neuroepinephrine and pretty much puts a lid on the boiling pot. Okay? So what happens then is that clonidine then <coughs> will then downregulate regulate cyclase, cyclin, and PKA such that there's less neuroepinephrine and that is the mechanism by which um, clonidine is very useful in the treatment of hypertension but also in the treatment of opiate withdrawal. Um, so let me give you some data that's uh, in humans that actually supports this. So clonidine became sort of um, in vogue in the 80s, um, yeah, the latter part of the 80s, for the treatment of adults who were going through detoxification programs. And what they found here was that these are adults that are being put under propofol anesthesia, and what they're given is um, they have they're measured their sympathetic activity with a small needle in probably the, the, um, the leg, the gastrocnemius muscle. But then what you basically see is that if they're awake, uh, you have this activity, which is sympathetic activity. They go under propofol anesthesia, and then you give an opioid receptor blockade. You give naloxone. So you put the person acutely into detoxification. And what you have is this marked upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system, and then they add clonidine to the therapy, and you see that there's a marked reduction in that. You see this also in the arterial blood pressure. If you then put an, uh, an arterial line into the individual or venous line, and you measure their epinephrine and their neuroepinephrine levels during this uh, detoxification program, you can actually see the person is awake, uh, and let's just follow out uh, this curve here. They do propofol anesthesia because they get very anxious and, and can have seizures under this protocol. They give the opiate blockade, uh, which is the acute detoxification. You get a marked increase in epinephrine levels, a neuroepinephrine levels and epinephrine levels. And here they add clonidine to the therapy and you see a marked reduction this line here is when they pre-treated the individual with clonidine prior to this detoxification program. So to us, uh, clonidine made sense. That if in fact you had an infant who was born to a mother who had been doing drugs, or if you had an infant who was now well from his acute illness and you were trying to then detoxify the baby, that in fact clonidine might be helpful. Um, and so we embarked upon a, um, a, a randomized controlled trial, and here are the investigators, and I'd like to show you some of those results. What we did was we took babies who were born to mothers um, who had been exposed to methadone or heroin, and we randomized them to treatment with an opiate uh, called DTO at the time, um, tincture of opium, and that's what we were using for therapy. Um, 
or in nothing else, or we gave the baby the tincture of opium, which is a morphine uh, derivative, as well as clonidine. Um, it was blinded, so we didn't know which babies got the, the placebo versus the babies that got the clonidine. And our primary endpoint was to look at the length of treatment defined as the need for any pharmacological treatment for neonatal abstinence syndrome and the amount of DTO needed to treat NAS. Uh, secondary outcomes were uh, basically the, the, neuro, uh, the abstinence score um, and whether there was any adverse effects from hypotension or bradycardia associated with this therapy. Um, so babies were between 0 and 14 days of age. They, as I mentioned, exposed to heroin or methadone. They had opiate. Now, in the situation where a baby is born, then that's when the opiate exposure stops. So we just observe the baby to actually see if the baby develops any signs and symptoms of opiate withdrawal. We have a scoring system called the Finnegan scoring system that we actually look at um, it was published in the 80s, which was very nicely done, so that we could actually put some objective, uh, some objectivity to the infant's uh, symptomatology. So he gets a score for how many, how long is he awake, how loud his cry is, how much poop the baby has over the day, uh, irritability, rub marks, that sort of thing, tachypnea, inability to sleep, and we score that. Um, so a score of equal to nine, greater or equal to nine on two consecutive scores, the infant was randomized to DTO and placebo or DTO and clonidine. Uh, you can look at the exclusion criteria there, but for the sake of time, I will not go through all of that. So um, we ended up randomizing 80 babies, 40 to the placebo group and DTO and 40 to the clonidine group and DTO. It was an intention to treat paradigm, so any baby that went into that uh, category, that's how we analyze their data. You can see that the mothers here, that the age of the mothers were not very different uh, between the clonidine and DTO group and the placebo. Um, the vaginal C-section delivery was similar um, and the vaginal delivery was similar between the two groups. Methadone dose uh, between the two groups was also appropriate, uh, about the same, and exposure of the opiate, uh, the mother was on maintenance therapy or heroin for about eight years in each one of the groups. The characteristic of the infants included, again, were not statistically different with the exception to the birth weight. Uh, the babies who ended up going in the clonidine group were a little smaller, but at the time that they went on therapy, which was only about three, which was approximately three days out of birth, after birth, the babies um, ended up being around the same size. Um, you can look at the ethnicity here, the gender status, the methadone exposure, the morphine exposure, and cocaine with opiates um, uh, was similar in the same in the group. We included two sites of the Johns Hopkins Hospital and the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Um, and for those who are not familiar with survival curves, I'm going to take this moment and describe this. This is often what you see in cancer therapies or treatment therapies. And we use this analysis to determine, uh, use this statistical analysis to ask the question, let us know if a, when the baby is off of medication. So if it's a way to read these curves, you look at the cumulative survival. So every baby who's on treatment, um, it's 100%. And as the babies come off of treatment, uh, the percentage goes down. So for if you look at uh, all the babies, you see that 70% are treated at uh, six days. So 75% 70, I mean of babies are on medicine at, um, at um, six days of life. 50, then babies start to come off of their medicine. 50% of the infants are still treated at 13 days. And this says that 25% of the infants are still treated at 21 days. So this is all babies together. 